So our next presenter will be presenting SIDH on ARM, faster modular multiplication for faster post-quantum super-singular isogen. Oh, that's the wrong, wrong one. Oh, that's the wrong, yeah. <laughs> uh, the first one, yeah. Sorry, wrong page. So this is actually FPGA hammer. Remote voltage, fault attacks on shared FPGA suitable for DFA on AES. Presented by Jonas Krauter, uh, co-authored with Dennis Kanad and Mehdi Tahuri. Thank you very much. That was good, wasn't it? Was good enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to my talk on remote voltage fault attacks on shared FPGAs. Before I will go into detail, I first want to motivate a bit why we are considering shared FPGAs at all. So with the increasing amount of resources we have per FPGA chip, I, they are increasingly considered uh, for usage in multi-user environments. So a lot of providers are introducing them to cloud computing. Uh, we see a lot of system on-chip variants where we have FPGAs coupled very tightly with a hard processor. And uh, the Linux kernel actually already introduced support for um, partial reconfiguration of FPGAs, which gives us multi-tenant FPGAs where the accelerators per user can be deployed to partitions on the same chip. So, and this uh, opens up a range of new attack scenarios, two of which have been already considered in uh, previous works, such as on-chip side channels or denial of service attacks. And for this work, we wanted to consider fault attacks. And uh, as a proof of concept, we successfully um, deployed a differential fault attack on AES. So the threat model we are considering is uh, a single shared FPGA fabric. So that also includes a shared power distribution network for both adversary and victim. And the designs on the FPGA are in logically isolated partitions. But we have some kind of public interface in the victim process, which is running on a CPU uh, and which can be accessed by the adversary to make the victim use his uh, cryptographic implementation on the FPGA. So this gives us, for in the case of AES, gives us this chosen plain text attack scenario where the adversary can just um, issue requests f uh, with plain texts to the victim process and get the ciphertext back. So in the further course of this talk, I will give you some background information on the mechanics behind these attacks. I will talk about how we specifically design the fault injection and analysis. I will present details on the hardware we used in the experimental setup. Um, I will present the results. Then I will discuss them and give some perspective on future works and finally conclude the task. So for the background information, we first need to talk about these uh, power distribution networks which basically include all the interconnections from the uh, voltage regulator on the board down to each logic element in the chip. And they are usually modeled as this mesh of resistive, inductive, and capacitive elements. And uh, the influence of the inductive and resistive elements on the uh, power supply voltage are reflected in this law of inductance. And we can see that a high current variation uh, can cause uh, a power supply voltage variation. And a lower supply voltage can eventually cause timing faults in critical parts of a design on an FPGA, for example. So the logic element we use to cause high current variation uh, is ring oscillators, and they have been already used in previous works on denial of service attacks to crash FPGAs. Um, and we use not only a single one, but an entire grid of ring oscillators to have a high impact on the power supply voltage. So the principle is that the high oscillation of these oscillators, the gate switching of them, causes a high current variation and eventually a voltage drop to inject a fault into another design on the FPGA. And uh, we found that it's not enough to just switch it on and let it oscillate. But uh, the ring oscillator grid must be toggled in a very specific way. Um, and we identified three parameters that uh, have an effect on the success of, success of the fault injection. 
which is the frequency duty cycle and the initial delay of this toggle signal. So for example, in this uh, diagram, you see the uh, externally measured supply voltage of the FPGA while decreasing the toggle frequency in the area uh, between the red bars. So the fault injection, the fault analysis we used is a very well known uh, by Piri from 2003. And the original scheme uh, intends to inject single byte faults before the eighth round of the AES encryption, which leads to all output bytes um, to be faulty, so they can all be detected simultaneously. But since we needed to uh, get a very high precision to inject before the eighth round, we um, decided to inject before the ninth round instead and attack only four bytes at a time. So uh, this allows us, since the propagation of a single byte fault before the ninth round uh, results in a specific set of four bytes in the output ciphertext to be affected, this allows us to verify the successful injection from the ciphertext. So okay, we can filter out basically a, a whole lot of uh, faults injected at the wrong time. And we developed some kind of calibration uh, for the attacker, where he can first issue an encryption request with a plain text X to get the correct ciphertext, and then continuously um, issues encryption requests with the same plain text while activating the ring oscillator grid with a very specific par parameters. And um, he can then, as previously explained, verify the successful injection from the output ciphertexts and uh, can adapt these parameters accordingly and reissue requests to the victim until uh, he found parameters where he could successfully inject faults at the right round of AES and then continue with the actual attack. So this calibration needs to be only done once for a specific board, and then we can just uh, continuously perform new attacks on the same board. Uh, the hardware we used uh, is these two boards from Terraslic, the DE1 SOC and the DE0 Nano SOC. So we used uh, three boards of the same time type and uh, two different boards in total to show the generality uh, of this attack and how the calibration can adapt to different boards. And all of these boards are by, based on the Cyclone 5 FPGA together with an ARM Cortex-A9 on the single chip. And uh, we have a Linux environment running on this ARM core. So this uh, essentially gives us the entire thread model on one SOC. We have attack and victim running software on the ARM core, and they have their respective IP cores on the FPGA fabric. And we only did the fault injection part on this system on chip and collected faulty ciphertexts, and the key recovery was afterwards done on the, on the PC. So for the results, we first evaluated the general fault in injection rate for 1 million requests. Um, with, with uh, respect to the number of ring oscillators used by the attacker. And we performed these experiments first on the DE1 SOC board, where the AES design uh, of the victim was fully constrained, so no potential timing violations were reported by uh, the develop development tools. And we distinguished um, usable and the total amount of faults. So the total amount of faults is uh, just uh, any kind of fault appearing in the output ciphertext, while only the usable faults can be used for key recovery, so the correct four bytes in the output ciphertext are affected. And uh, we see here in this diagram where the blue line is the total amount of faults and the red line the usable faults for DFA we see that um, the injection rate in general increases with the amount of ring oscillators. Um, but we have some, at some point here uh, for this board, after 44% uh, uh, resource usage by the attacker, we have the, the case that the accuracy decreases actually, so the amount of usable faults decreases again, simply because uh, the ring oscillator grid is, has too much effect on the victim design and the calibration cannot find any parameters anymore to adapt to this new situation. 
Uh, this attack, we, this evaluation of fault injection rates, we extended to three different DE1 SOC boards. And we see that all of them are vulnerable. And in general, the calibration can find the appropriate parameters to inject the faults with the needed precision. But we also see that uh, due to process variation, um, there's a different optimal amount of ring oscillators used by the attacker for the attack. But you can uh, simply find the uh, amount that works on all the boards So, by looking at the, the overlap of the different um, evaluations. And uh, eventually, we also evaluated the actual key recovery on 5,000 random keys. Um, and these experiments we also did on the D1 SOC with the best uh, configuration for each specific board for the fault injection. And we see that the majority of keys could be recovered. So about 90% of the keys can be recovered for each board. We have uh, a couple of keys with only a few candidates remaining, two or four candidates, which can be easily finalized with a brute force search. Um, but we also have some keys which uh, cannot be recovered because uh, this verification by looking at the, the output bytes of the output ciphertext uh, cannot distinguish uh, between some multi-byte faults and single-byte faults injected before the ninth round. So some multi-byte faults um, are still collected but cannot be used for key recovery, which leads to this few uh, non-recoverable keys. So we showed uh, this attack on a fully constrained design on this D1 SOC board with uh, less than 50% resources used by the attacker. On the smaller DE0 Nano, it has only half the amount of resources. Um, the fully constrained design was not vulnerable. So we see that not all devices are equally vulnerable. In this case, the power supply was uh, the same on both boards. But uh, with only half the amount of resources, the attacker could not attack a fully constrained design um, with less than 50% of these reduced resources. And um, there may be also alternatives to using ring oscillators. Uh, so there may be other malicious logic that causes a high current variation and eventually voltage drops. And we also thought about extending this attack to other devices connected to the same uh, power distribution network, such as, in this case, the ARM core on the SOC. Uh, we also discussed some possible mitigations, for example, by using internal sensors, TDC-based probably, um, to detect an attack or uh, use bitstream checking to identify malicious logic in an attacker design. And finally, what we can also do, but requires hardware modifications, is uh, putting different designs on different voltage islands on the FPGA, sacrificing some flexibility, of course. So in conclusion, we showed how high precision fault injection on shared FPGAs is possible, and logical isolation between designs is not enough to prevent manipulation. And uh, we show that this threat model must be considered if we want to use FPGAs in multi-user environments. And uh, mitigation may even need some modifications to hardware or new hardware architectures. With that, I want to conclude my talk. And you're welcome to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you for your thank you for your nice talk. Thank so you. I want to ask that you are you assuming the ring oscillator to be already present in the FPGA? Uh, no, the ring oscillator is introduced by the attacker. So basically, we have some architecture where um, multiple users can put their accelerators through partial reconfiguration on the same FPGA. Okay. And the attacker can just simply deploy a grid of ring oscillators to attack another user who probably put his AES on module on the same chip. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah. So the attack model, as it seems to me, is like uh, somebody has already reconfigured the FPGA and put some 
ring oscillator and now you are an attacker you are going to use that yes um, not i mean not necessarily use an existing structure for the attack but deploy your own ring oscillator grid onto another another partition of the same fpga okay okay yeah. got it thank you thank you okay so did you somehow have to had to modify um, your power supply of your victim board? So no, it wasn't modified. It's just stock. Thank you. Do you have, do you have any intuition about the, um, the the different fault rates you were getting, like the, the success rate on the different SOCs you were testing? Yeah. Do you have any any intuition any intuition why you were seeing those differences? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the, the oscillation of the ring oscillators is also uh, highly dependent on the process variation. So maybe the attacker design was simply more effective on uh, some of these FPGAs because uh, due to process variation, the oscillation was more high frequent or something. Yeah. So we still have time if anyone has any questions. Oh, there's someone waving at the back there. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Hi. Um, did you test on an Amazon cloud service? Like, it was the denial service attack? Uh, no, we did not. We did not test it yet. <laughs> but does it work? Like, in the, I don't know if the Amazon cloud service allows the other partition to access the same inputs and outputs of the other partition. Um, I mean, we don't necessarily need a direct uh, access of the inputs of the other partition. Uh, the idea was that the victim has uh, his software process running, and uh, using the software process uses the AES module or whatever this uh, victim put on the FPGA, and the attacker can access the software part through some kind of public interface which makes the uh, victim use his AES module. So it could be also a replay attack or something like that. So there's no direct logical connection between the designs on the FPGA. But uh, the attacker can just issue requests to some kind of software interface provided by the victim. Does it answer your question? Yeah, but um, I mean, if you technically are in a cloud service, I would suspect there will be some software isolation between process. So how sure, but I mean, the victim uh, put his AS module or whatever on the on the FPGA to use it for something, right? And uh, so, in some scenarios, maybe the attacker may be able to make the victim uh, encrypt the same plain text twice, which is all he needs, right, to, to perform a DFA, or there may be some other attacks on other ciphers. This was just a proof of concept. So uh, in a real world scenario, uh, it might be different, yeah. Um, this model of FPGA supports partial reconfiguration, or you use the uh, FPGA entirely and just throw it? I mean, we used, because it was simpler, we used just a sim uh, single design and put it on the FPGA, but it supports partial reconfiguration, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. So thank the speaker again.